All right, I've got the Lathrop brothers with me right now. We got Stephen and James. Do you guys want to give a little uh, overview of Lathrop and Sons and kind of how you started, especially that you guys, um, you guys have a long history of footwear. We started, uh, oh gosh, 30 years ago. Our father was a podiatrist, uh, did a lot of orthopedic work, and uh, we had two full-fledged facilities uh, with a retail shoe fitting center, um, orthotic fabrication, and um, fitting. We specialized, but James and I were licensed podorthists, so we filled a prescription for footwear, just like a doctor would write a prescription for you to go get antibiotics. We were basically filling in for ankle braces, foot braces, and custom shoes, lots of diabetic wound care, and foot deformities. So when you're doing that, you're playing with a lot of different materials. So we were always making our own footwear comfortable, helping with the treatment plan. And then, you know, <clears throat> us being very passionate about bow hunting, we started evolving, you know, working on footbed materials for hunting footwear and going out west on some of our earlier elk hunts. There is a big difference about what Lathrop and Sons does, whether it's the retail side or the custom side, because we do have that, and then we have our synergy or orthotics side as well. Mm -hmm. From the footwear side of things, that each model that James and I have um, brought to market, we own the midsoles, we have aluminum injection molds, massive expense we own every design we own all the cutting dies all the tooling to make these we have folders for the entire build project those are ours it is not a boot in italy that is already in production that someone stamped their name on mm -hmm. that's a massive difference between what Lathrop sons does and what a lot of these other people that are just selling footwear under a stamp name um, we both have our hands in the entire design, improvement, the materials, and finally, you know, signing off on how, you know, the final assembly is done. So it, it's, it's, it's our design. design. It's, it's, our, it it's, it's our design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have that for each and every model that we, we produce. Something you guys do that's interesting versus i would say the masses is your waterproof booty that you're using um you're using an event booty instead of a gore-tex which i feel like is would you say it's the minority like it's not better or it's not you know worse but it's most people are using gore-tex it seems like yeah i would say that's right i mean um most people are using gore-tex there's actually quite a bit of a difference between the two uh, materials and <clears throat> the key aspect that I uh, really sunk my teeth into was the ability of the of the material to actually dry out in a boot environment. Um, Gore-Tex and we've all worn them before they kind of well they don't kind of they do there's a clamminess inside of the boot day in day out kind of wearing it never really wants to dry out real quick and it's because the the nature of the material is a bit of a more of a it was explained to me as more of a wet system which perspiration is supposed to be absorbed through the material and go to the outside where the air molecules can draw it out draw it out and whip whip it away wick it away and even it doesn't work that way it's actually considered more of a, a dry system uh, the the holes are so small within there that the vapor can pass through and go out um, personally i'm a bit of more of a realist and i think that you know in, in anybody's laboratory where you've got these sophisticated sensors in there that can tell you percentages of how it works better over that, the human body really can't distinguish that at all. And so what really seems to me is the fact that 
when you take a boot off that you had worn the day before, everybody sweats through their feet. Mm-hmm. That's the way it is. But when you take your hand and stick it down in that boot the next day and realize that the, it is dry, like really dry in comparison to that Gore-Tex fabric, that to me tells a lot about that product. And it's really the reason why we jumped in to, to, to utilize it. And one other thing I kind of want to touch on, when these booties are actually developed, they're assembled very much the same way. The fabric's laid out on a sterile table. You have patterns that are die clicked out. They go through a hemming and a, a glue adhesive is put on there and the tape on the seam. Uh, very much like Gore-Tex. So it's, it's virtually assembled the same way. Um, but, and I've listened to this, I've heard this comment, even read about it. Uh, on various forums. The question is, why does this boot last, you know, one year and then all of a sudden it failed? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what has to be thought of and and people need to realize, you got to be realistic with, you know, the longevity of, of a waterproof membrane. If you use a particular boot that is really more of a hiking on a trail design, Um, and you try to use that application carrying a heavy load, doing a lot of side hilling, that foot is constantly going to be sliding off of the shank of it. Maybe it doesn't have a rubber rand going around it to help hold the foot in place. Mm -hmm. And so the the body weight, the pack weight, all that gear is pushing through that downhill side foot, pulling against those seams that are stitched together with a piece of tape on there. My point is, is there's only so many steps that those, those, that stitching can actually handle before it wants to bubble and then boom, water figures out a way of getting in, in there. Um, so regardless, yeah. even is, uh, that, that's something to be considered when, when looking yeah. at what kind of foot gear are you going to use um, to last a long time. That's interesting. Uh, and just those booties in general, they're super, super thin, right? Like, I don't think people realize how thin they really are. It doesn't, it's not like it, it's not like they're a super durable thing. That's why you have your protection around it to hopefully try to protect that booty you know, too. It, it, it is. And, and for the viewer to really grasp, at least with even how thin the laminate is this Teflon tape that you use for your plumbing. It's Mm -hmm. real similar. And Mm -hmm. I've pulled uh, the backers off. So you'll use like a face fabric and a backer fabric. It's a nylon and that's there to protect. And then your face fabric then is over the top of that and that's what's next to your foot. And you can get a whole host of different designs and, and, uh, yeah, different feel. Some have got a, a, a real light, like a nubuck feel to them and just a little different finish, right? Mm-hmm. But but it is, it's very thin. And and I've I've often tried to explain this to a lot of people. After going through the process and employing the right people and understanding and getting the real behind the scenes of making this. These two materials stuck under water are waterproof. Now, one may breathe better than the other, but I would venture to guess that better than 90% of any of this footwear that leaks, it all comes from the seam tape failing. Oh, I did. That's what I was getting at. Because if you think yeah. about this, you're taking a booty and you're butting basically two pieces of material together. And then that person is running it through a machine and it's as, kind of like a zigzag, okay? So zzz, it goes through. Zzz, that booty's mm-hmm. been done now. Then it's handed off to a person that puts it on this little, um, kind of like an anvil with a wheel and out on top of it, it's got the hot steam, you know, steam. Mm-hmm. That's, this seam tape goes on and as the steam sprayed onto it, 
the heat and the moisture cause the adhesive that's on the back of the seam tape to basically activate and then that little wheel presses it down. So you're pressing a pre um, uh, a pre tape basically with the adhesive on it that's activated by a hot you know steam, mm -hmm. and then the wheel presses it down into that thread area, and that's what's keeping water out. Well, he's right. So if you get this boot, this boot, or this boot and you're really working it in a three-quarter ton truck scenario where you're straining that boot you're pulling on that seam tape right and, and flexing is just as bad right you know mm -hmm. that shoe is meant to look like a shoe last like the shape of a foot well when you're twisting it back and forth you're straining all that and depending on the way that the pattern of the booty is made would also have a bearing on what activity might strain that boot more prematurely. Like you can change the position of the tape and the conversion of the two points. You Where can change that. Together. And that all has to do with longevity of product. And this is what we this is what James and I have have done. Mm -hmm. This is what we've been doing since 2017 and two years prior to that is cut it, buying boots at full retail price, cutting the boots apart and looking at how they're put together. Having experts that make this material realize we're a direct to consumer brand. We are committed to making the highest level boot imaginable with the best components behind the leather. Not a bunch of fancy colors. Mm -hmm. And we need to know what do we need to do to make this better? Because yeah. most people aren't willing to do that. The podcast is brought to you in part by First Light Technical Clothing, keeping me dry and comfortable from the duck blind to the backcountry. Check out all of their offerings at firstlight.com. Sig Sauer from the popular cross rifle, which I love to everything optics, handguns, ammunition, and accessories, visit sigsour.com for their full lineup. And Onyx Hunt Maps, I use Onyx Maps to plan and execute my own hunts, plus keep everything organized and accounted for at the outfit. I'm always scouting with the app. Check them out at onyxhunt.com. The, uh, yeah, the main reason like I wanted to talk about waterproofing is I've been able to like write a few articles over the years, like multiple articles of uh, boots and footwear and and I'll get along with something really well and then I'll talk to somebody else and they'll be like, they started leaking in the first week. Like I can't, you know, they just go through all these boots that they've tried and they're like, we can't keep them from leaking. And part of me is like, are they really leaking though? Or is it your perception of like, you have, you don't have realistic expectations of what waterproofing is so your foot uh sweating you think that that's the boot is leaking when it's just your foot sweating do you think that that happens no, i think it's po i think it's possible and there's also condensation that takes place human body's temperatures around what 98.6 mm -hmm. you go walking in water all day long the water soaks through the leather on the upper. I brought a cutaway of a boot in. You've got this booty right here. See this? So you walk in water, you walk through water all day long. You don't go over this, but mm -hmm. you're saturating this portion of the boot. Eventually water starts to soak through because you've got seam little little holes here, right? This is with every footwear. This isn't just ours. So this water is going through this area, right? Now it's building up behind the leather and the booty. You know what it's like when you've been hiking for two hours and your feet, you're hot, your feet are hot yeah. from hiking, and you walk through a bunch of cold water, you're like, ah, oh, that feels good, man. It's because the water's getting through the leather and synthetic. Everyone wants a leather synthetic boot. You know, fit is one reason, performance is another. But the thing of it is, is when that water flows in, it's now 
trapped behind the upper and the booty in that cavity right there, okay? Mm -hmm. When that water gets in there, it pillows behind it. And when we leak test boots, you can actually put your hand down into this boot and you can feel that water pillowing. It's like a water bed. It's kind of puffy when you touch it. Well, you're right. Is it really leaking? Is it fair to say a boot's leaking when you put your hand down into that boot and you feel this and it feels damp? No, that's not like that is condensation. No different than these commercial windows in our building here. When mm -hmm. it's 70 degrees in this room and it's one degree outside, it's normal to have on these window sills a little bit of condensation that, that builds up. And it happens in boots. It does. I guess I'm going to say it. I think some of this could be, could be um, the consumer. You know, mm -hmm. how are they drying the boot out? in the back country. Are they taking their boots out after they've been slodging in water, slopping around in water all day and just setting the boot on the sole? Or has someone taught them to flip the boot over and let the water run out? Do you recommend taking the insoles out too when you're drying? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's so fast. It makes it so much faster. It does and it gives that, gives the boot a chance to get some airflow going through and it gives the footbed a chance to the, the top cover material to dry out. Um, but inverting that boot allows any of the water that we talked about that was trapped in there to run out the top cuff of that boot. And you've got to think about that. We, we, we've got foams and paddings in here. And if you don't, this water has been stagnated in there from just waiting water all day, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you have this on here, this ran, you still have holes and it, it, it finally works its way in. You gotta flip it upside down, you have to. So I was gonna bring this up. One other thing, there is always going to be human error with anything that's built. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. The standard is about 2%. About 2% and that's if you're really <laughs> cracking the whip and making sure that people are signing off on the built project step by step and James and I do that. We have every boot, every booty, we do 100% leak testing. Yeah, we do. And any boot, booty that is leak has a leak when that's tested, it goes back through they identify where that is. They'll seam tape that area again, test it again. If it does not pass, it goes in the trash and they start over again. And then each boot that is run through the production, every 24th boot is pulled and subjected to four hours of leak testing to make that sure that there hasn't been, if they do find one that leaks at 25, they go test 25. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They make sure that that we've segmented 25 pairs of boots that none of the rest have had that. That's how we've had to do it, to do it right. Yeah. Is leak testing as easy as just filling up water in your sink and you stick the boot in it like you'd be walking through water and just leave it? I think you could do you could do that. You have to be you have to be careful. You have to have again the environment right. You know, you don't want it super hot outside and you bring out a tub of ice cold water or something because there you mm -hmm. can get some condensation that takes place in there. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. That's that's one test that you can do. You can fill the boot up with water and let the water try to seep out of the boot. Um, but when you push four hours, that's a long leak test. Like that yeah. is essentially standing in water for four hours straight. And these are not rubber boots. Now I was gonna say mm -hmm. they're not, they're not boot. rubber boots. So if it passes four, four hours, hours, it's good to go. <laughs> that's a, that, can you imagine fly fishing in your Lathrop and Sons boots for four <laughs> hours? Because that's no. essentially what you're doing, you know? So before, uh, bef I want to move on to fit uh, a little bit more and especially your insoles and some issues that like hard insoles can lead to, which um, I know we've talked about a little bit before. Can you give a, like 
uh, the synthetic versus leather. That that used to be a huge debate, and now I know that that people are kind of blending them and making you know reinforcing uh, places with leather. That's technically a synthetic boot. Anyways, can you just give like a if somebody's just they've got all these boots in front of them, the synthetic and leather. What what is your take on it? There is a trend to that. It used to all be leather, then leather synthetic, and then all fully synthetic. Well, I think mm-hmm. a lot of it has to do with the synthetic material. It's not going to uh, draw water. It's not going to absorb mm-hmm. it. So therefore, it's going to dry out much, much faster. Um, personally, I think, and Stephen talked a little bit about uh, your synthetic materials, they water can pass through that very much like a screen in a screen door. Um, well, you can get debris that can finite dust that can go through there as well, which is which is good if you have a, a boot that has some synthetic materials there. Um, periodically, one really should try to kind of rinse that out as much as possible so you don't get a bunch of grit underneath that. Um, leather, you know, on, uh, it's going to basically if you don't treat it, if you don't put a wax or a cream on there to keep it moisturized, eventually it can dry out and crack. Um, but it does, I believe, a, a, a little better job of keeping that finite dust from being able to get into it. Well, there's a fist thing with it too, right? Like a, there are certain foot types, believe it or not, that might lend themselves to a leather synthetic boot because of the actual placement of the synthetic material. Mm -hmm. Like if you've got someone that's, just an example, if you've got somebody that has a really high arch, right? Or a spur on top of there, I guess. Yeah, Yeah. and and the, the mesh material would be slightly more accommodating, so it would shape more to the top of the foot and feel more Mm -hmm. comfortable to them. Um, A faster drying time, but again, you know, I look at some of this stuff as application use too. Like if I was going on a moose hunt and I was gonna be wading through, you know, real muddy, boggy, peaty stuff, I probably wouldn't wear like an Elite. Mm-hmm. Um, that is more of a boot that could be used in, you know, high desert hunts to alpine use, uh, semi-automatic crampon use, uh, a little faster dry time with it, um, just a little more performance driven. It's going to be a little cooler because you're going to get a little more airflow through that boot. But let's not forget, we still got a piece of that uh, waterproof membrane, and even though Event does breathe, you still feel it. You, it is mm-hmm. not like wearing a pair of boots that doesn't have any kind of membrane in it. You can clearly feel that. And I hear another one that's kind of funny, and this is along the line of leather boots. They say, why why do I wear leather boots? My feet are always so dry. It's because the leather boot lining is like a chamois that you wipe a car off with. So it's just sucking the water away from your skin. The problem mm. with that that I see is that the human foot, when it perspires, that sweat's very acidic. Therefore, it's really hard on that leather lining. And here you mm. have a boot that you just spent $450 for and you get a season out of them and you basically rock out the cuff of the boot. Now the lining, every time you put the boot on, is slipping down. Now how the hell do you get a new, how do you get a new liner in a boot when the upper looks good and sole? It's a problem because it's built from the inside out. Right, right interesting there's so much to it really and the folks just don't i mean most people just don't think about stuff like that they're like if i buy a 450 fifty dollar boot that thing better last me 15 years oh i know <laughs> i know yeah you you buy at that level of boot for what it can actually do for your foot comfort wise that's what it boils down to it doesn't mean that it's going to last 20 years at all <laughs> no, and, yeah. and you don't realize it. You're just like, that's old faithful. But at the end of the day, when you do put on that boot and that boot fits and it has been fitted to your foot and you feel you feel that, that fit, that comfort, 
the performance that you get out of it, I mean, it's not a stretch to say it's a bit of confidence, you know? It's like you feel sure-footed. You've got just got a little kick in your step to get you off your toe and get you going. And and, and until people really put it on and, and try it, they don't really know, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've been kind of blessed with my feet so far. Um, I, haven't, I don't really have any troubles. Um, but I know that there's folks that have come to you guys that have foot problems. And you guys can customize that to their issues and work with them on it until you get it right, which is, you know, that's that's pretty big for somebody who struggles. Well, it, it is. You brought something up earlier, and, and, and it was about rigid orthotics versus, you know, um, more of a soft accommodative like our yeah. synergy orthotic, which is that. And, and I actually brought this in here because I wanted to show folks this. So... Um, you, everyone's seen these, right? James and I made these for 30 years in our clinic. Hard plastic shells, right? Yeah. Well, the one thing that we have to understand with that is we're putting that inside that boot, right? Mm-hmm. And it's only bracing from the heel to the ball of the foot. See that? I'm trying the best. From the heel to the ball of the foot. Yep. Well... This works okay if the clinician shapes the shell perfectly to the inside of that boot because it's hard to see, but there is actual curvature to this. Mm -hmm. So this has to be fitted perfect, not only to fit the curvature, but it also has to fill the back of the heel. So the, the actual shape of this shell, this profile, is to fit. must fit this perfectly. If it does not fit perfectly, what ends up happening is inversion takes place. And that means that the shell gets tilted inside this to, to get it to fit. And what you start doing from walking is you start pressing this membrane into the side of the boot. And the side of the boot, any mountain hunting boot, I don't mean a backpacking boot, a mountain hunting boot mm -hmm. that has any structure to it, with that shell sits there and is teeter-tottering back and forth, back and forth. And you pull this thing out and you look, you will see this indention and it is called densification. And if you cause densification of that liner, you didn't strain that membrane you fractured the cell structure of the membrane and that boot's gonna start leaking in that area, okay? It yeah. will, definitely. So, so this, not done right here, will actually take away from the time that you're gonna to get to use this in a waterproof setting. It will start to leak. On top of that, James and I explained this over and over, so we're, we're here, people can see that the length that you're balancing the foot and you got this thin piece of EVA within a matter of 20 minutes, it's flattened out. But get this, when we climb in the mountains, we're climbing in a mountain, we don't, we've got the toe into the side of the mountain, the back of the foot suspended. Mm -hmm. This is what's wrong with this concept. The part you're trying to support with this type of device is actually suspended from here back. You're doing nothing from here forward, but this is what's making mm -hmm. contact with the mountain when you're climbing, right? And we mm -hmm. don't climb like this. We climb like this. We dig the toe in and that's suspended. It's really something for, for someone to think about before they go invest $300 in a pair of hard plastic shells to put in their shoes. I get it if you want to walk on concrete all day in a training shoe or you want to wear a boot like this, walk on moderate terrain, but think about the application. Approach it like you would selecting the bullet or the round for the animal you're going to hunt, right? The same goes with your footwear. It's about performance, not what your buddy's wearing. It's about performance. We're all a little different. That's why they make bows now. I think Hoyt's even actually doing it in quarter inch increments in this new can. Yeah. I mean, it's all about this stuff. Yeah, like really precise fitting. Um, yeah. One one thing I wanted to talk about with fit that I got this tons on, I, I would do a boot, a boot review, I'd come out with it, and literally one of the first questions was, how is the arch support? And to be honest with you, I don't even know how to answer that. 
I know. It's like, I'm just like, what is that? Like, you don't, like, well, you guys know, but the per- the person asking, I kind of just got to the point where I'm like, I don't even think you know what you're asking. I don't exactly know what you're asking. They yeah. don't. They've been trained to think that because a lot of these tennis shoe companies have talked about the arch support. To be honest with you, shoes, boots, whatever, they don't necessarily have a traditional arch support. They're not designed that way. The way you control the foot is by, and this comes from 31 years of working in a podiatry practice. Mm -hmm. There's a minimalist movement out there. Drives us crazy. Tell them what you mean by that. (laughs) No heel, zero drop. Uh, Yeah. There's a minimalist movement. So like a flat sole shoe. shoe. If you look at the foot, you got your heel bone and you got the ball of foot. Let's say your foot completely splays out, pancakes. My son's got pancakes for feet. If you're standing there barefoot like that, everything's splayed out. If we're wanting to try to create some arch, if we simply take a bit of a wedge and slide it up underneath the calcaneus, we've raised it up in the air. Now the ball of the foot's down lower than what the heel is. And naturally, if you look at from the middle or the inside of the foot, you've actually created arch support. And you've cut, and you've encouraged the foot to propel off the ball Absolutely. the way that we want to. That's why in all these types of foot gear, you want to have a little bit of extra heel height to reduce the tightness in the back of the leg so that you can get through that much, much easier and better. The, but to, to go to your point, like, Someone says, you know, uh, you like that boot, Jordan. How much arch support does it have? And you're like, I don't, I don't think this person knows what they're asking. Well, I don't think they do either. And I think they've read a little bit too much because no one wants to answer that question the right way, which is they don't have any arch support because they're instantly going to think the boot's bad. But the reality is, what you're getting ready to tell them is right. Like, think about what I just said. You're, you've bought a pair of boots, you're wearing a pair of boots, you're giving honest feedback, and they ask a, a, a bizarre question like, how's the arch support? And your response is correct to a couple of professionals with 30 years, Jordan, you're right. The answer is they don't have any. They're not supposed to have, quote unquote, arch support. They're supposed to have torsional stability. Yeah, they have torsional stability. Torsional this is, stability. This is actually something I want to touch on. It's actually kind of funny. How many people out there think that a cowboy boot has a lot of arch support? Exactly. There's nothing about a cowboy boot that looks like it's got arch support. However, if you're talking to somebody that's got chronic plantar fasciitis. Arch pain. Heel pain, heel pain. arch pain. And you talk to these people, I've done this many, many times, trying to convince a gentleman to look at their foot gear because their shoes are shot, trying to convince them to do something else. And in this, they're sitting there kind of looking at, yeah, you're just trying to sell me another (laughs) pair of shoes. No, the importance of this is the heel height on it. It helps create the stability that we're talking about. How about this? Do you have a set of cowboy boots? Well, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. How's your foot feeling that with that cowboy boot on? Well, my heel doesn't bother me any. It's because it's doing everything that I just oh, said. It's offloading. It's offloading the tension on that fascial band. It's creating a bit of an arch for that person. Mm. So you're really trying to balance the foot up uh, as much as you can is what you're trying to do. So well, that's a good point, yeah. though. That's okay. So do you feel like uh, the insoles, the aftermarket insoles that you can get off the shelf, Superfeet? I've recommended Superfeet before. Do you feel like there's actually a, there's a place for those? Yeah, I don't frown. What I frown on is that every everybody that I talk to thinks that they're throwing stuff in a boot and they're not really understanding why they're putting it in their boot. They're just doing yeah. it because... The guy at the hiking shop said, boy, if you want to do this, and they've told him upsell. Well, the whole concept with what we're using, which is the Synergy footbed, it Mm -hmm. is a two-part material that is mixed through a static mixing one right in our climate control lab, poured, die cut, and custom fit to that boot. 
the rigidity of the boot, the rock in that boot, the heel height in our boot, the toe spring. This is everything he's talking about, heel height and rock. This, our father was involved in our midsole process, just like James and I were. We, I, I mentioned we own the molds. That's a huge part. Mm -hmm. The midsole of the boot. The midsole of the boot right here. This. Yep. This is the engine. This is what pushes you forward. This is the heel height that we worked and worked and worked to get built. The distance from here to there. So when you, when you put that into a boot and then you put a polymer material that wraps around the foot, it absorbs impact. It then reduces rebound. This is important. Rebound coming back into the foot will beat you down, okay? Um, if, if any of the listeners have ever rode a dirt bike, you hold on to the handlebars and you're riding through a bunch of whoops, it's just banging your forearms to mm -hmm. death. You want that suspension to not have a ton of rebound because a rebound will eject you off the bike and it will fatigue you. This material that we're utilizing really is like a Tempur-Pedic gel. So a Tempur-Pedic mm -hmm. mattress, you hit it, Boom, it decelerates, but it doesn't just shoot back up into your body. The characteristics coupled with the covers that we laminate to them, placed in this type of footwear and daily footwear for the right problems, stop a ton of issues. Hot spots, blistering, fatigue, you know, it just, it works. I think my 30 years of experience, the orthopedic wound care professionals that trained me when I was in my 20s said to offload the human foot to prevent it from sores relating to people that can't feel their feet. Mm -hmm. In a wound care center, a rigid rocker shoe with an accommodative material. You, you put those two things together and you will maintain the healed status. Once you get them healed up, that's been something across the board. And I know that's a little deep, but the thing that is, is this is what we do. This is what we've yeah. been doing. Yeah. And that, that accommodative uh, orthotic, like you're talking about for the listeners, it's kind of, I have a set of your elite boots with that insole and it's, um, it's super cushy. It's super wow. comfortable. Earlier when you were saying people are just throwing stuff in their boots, like, and it's hurt it's hurting them in the long run or given the manufacturer you think the boot sucks because you put what you did is you just put a an insole that shouldn't be oh, in we it have, we've had people do that they've got our footwear and said man i can't wear this boot this hurt the side of my foot well did we get the wrong side and and we're happy to do this mm -hmm. but now we're on a 20 minute call with this guy and you know all he simply did was get online and buy a set of boots uh, so we sent the boot out and he said, hey, it's hurting the side of my foot. Well, you know, I got a pair of XYZ orthotics mail order. I stuck them in there. You know, they didn't fit real great, but I went ahead and put them in there. And you're like, really? And he goes, yeah, they're pushing the side of the boot over. Well, he's overcorrected. It's, it's throwing him laterally to right. the side of the boot. So now his toes are colliding with the side of the boot and it's causing all fitment issues. So you'll say to him, take it out of the boot, slip this in. What does it feel like? Oh, it's like night and day. It's like you flipped the switch. Better. Yeah, it's, you've got to match this stuff up correctly. <laughs> what boots do you guys have uh, available right now that folks can check out? You've got your Elite. I, I have your Elite boot. Yeah, we've got the Elite. That's more of our Alpine category boot, but it's pretty versatile. And again, we talked about it. It's good for um, all, all around. I wouldn't get it in, mm -hmm. a, in a lot of mud. But then we have our Mountain Hunter, which is an all leather boot. Mountain Hunter Warm. We offer the Mountain Hunter Warm, which is a 200 Prima Loft booty inside that. We offer a 2E width in both of those. Yeah, a 2E and a medium and in the we, Mountain Hunter and Mountain Hunter Warm. And then we came out with a new one called a Super Wide. All right. And that mm -hmm. Super Wide, it's great. 
Um, and we offer that in, in a wide, or I'm sorry, the <laughs> warm and the, in the, we offer, we're getting to have too many boots. So yeah. <laughs> we all of them. And we have an Encompass boot, which is more of a lighter trekking style of boot. And, and I'm yeah. going to say something while we're on this. I'll keep it short, but it's the fact. People say to us, they look at these boots and they say, well, how much is this boot? How much is this boot? How much is this boot? And to be quite honest with you, every one of these boots are almost identical in cost. And they think because it's a lighter duty boot, it should be less because that's what the industry has done. What the industry does, yeah. they make a lighter duty boot out of cheaper materials and charge you less for it. Mm -hmm. Latherbinson's built an encompass. It's a lighter duty boot. We use the same standard. That boot costs us the same amount of money as it does to make any of the other ones. And that's the truth. Yeah. Where, uh, where are you guys located? South Robinson, Illinois, Southeastern Illinois, about, I'd say two hours from two and a half from St. Louis, two hours from Indianapolis about an hour and a half from evansville indiana okay so folks can like you guys have a storefront and people can yeah, come we in have, and we try have people on. that'll fly in we'll pick them up and at our our airport locally and bring them in we'll have people fly into indy or st louis for business and come over and we can set appointments up and a lot of people get concerned because they they think that you know they're going to make a mistake in the mail. We do a lot of it through the mail, but we're we're getting more and more people that are wanting to come in and and experience, you know, the new showroom and and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really nice, and it is good to sit down with someone and and see them face to face. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was what I wanted to cover with you guys. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. good, Dale. Thanks for listening to this episode of Jordan's Toolkit. If you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please visit the website jordan-bud.com and follow the links to submit an email or voicemail to be played on air. If you're listening on an audio platform, you can also watch this podcast on YouTube via Jordan Bud's personal channel.